This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Oh, hello, hello, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And as you know, we're still in the middle of this, whatchamacallit, world. The fourth turning, the COVID pandemic. We're very excited today to have a very special guest. His name is David Stockman. Some of you may know of him as... Um, Reagan's economic advisor. He's also, David was a Michigan congressman. And he's um, a refugee from New York City right now. <laughs> there are many people. <laughs> well, I, I was just talking to my neighbor who is a very wealthy person. She says Aspen is packed with New Yorkers right now. This is their, their yeah, running. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. So anyway, um, I'm, there's so much to talk to you about. It. And well, no, I just want to welcome you to the show, David. We've been looking forward to this because with everything going on, I know you've, you're a wealth of a wealth of knowledge and uh, we're anxious to hear from you. So I'm going to ask you the obvious question, like Reagan is kind of the godfather of the Republican Party, which is now in shambles. But anyway, uh, yeah. rather than get, I, I like to start with something that I always thought interesting about your background is you went to a Harvard Divinity School and... I would like to know how that affected your outlook on today, given everything. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. It was 1968. We had a fair amount of chaos going on in 1968. Peak of Vietnam War. I was an SDS anti-war protester, uh, like most uh, undergraduates were then. We had the big riots in the summer of 1968. And, Detroit, Newark, you can remember these far worse than anything that we've seen now, which is bad enough in, say, Minneapolis or Portland. And uh, I basically was graduating from Michigan State, and I had two choices. I could get a scholarship from Robert McNamara to go to the jungles of Vietnam and get myself <laughs> thrown up, or I could find some way to get a deferment, uh, bide my time, and survive for another day to talk about it. So I applied to Harvard Divinity School. I was a student of liberal arts, history, religion. As an undergraduate, got accepted. Uh, I, I hid out there for two years. Uh, I did not get an education in economics at Harvard, fortunately. Uh, I studied uh, history and philosophy and religion. And then, uh, you know, the war kind of wound down. The draft ended. I got a high lottery number. I happened to have a job at the time as a live-in student for Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Wow. Uh, he was Nixon's chief advisor at the moment, you know, became a famous senator and all the rest. But anyway... He got me a job in Washington working for a Republican congressman. That uh, was 1970, and one thing led to the next. I got elected to Congress in 1976 when I was 30, and I thought that was quite something. And then I got down there, and I found out that there were two other 30-year-old hotshots elected in my class as well, 1976, uh, Al Gore and Dan Quayle. So <laughs> I was the only one that didn't get to be vice president. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that was a long time ago. And I think the, the moral of the story is, you know, I've been watching this for 50 years now. And I think you're right. What we're experiencing this summer uh, in spring is really uh, off the charts, uh, unprecedented. And I think uh, it's far worse than uh, people imagine. In other words, we've had a terrible assault on the economy, on personal liberty, on even due process, you know, under the Constitution by agencies of the state that I call the virus patrol, you know, the lockdown nation, uh, that is totally disproportionate to a problem we have. You know, uh, the COVID is a serious flu pandemic, but it's not the black plague. It's not an existential threat to American society. Uh, it's uh, not an equal opportunity killer. It is unfortunately uh, a disease that attacks overwhelmingly the elderly, the infirm, those with comorbidities or life-threatening uh, conditions already. And yet we have put in place across the country a one-size-fits-all strategy of you know, closing the bars, closing the restaurants, shutting down the sporting events, closing uh, the theme parks, uh, and uh, shutting down uh, jobs like never before. You know, we've had 50 million people 
in the last 16 weeks filed for unemployment. Just numbers that are off the charts that are 1930s uh, scale. So uh, I think we've got a lot to cope with here, and there's also a lot to uh, unpack. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, which I guess wouldn't surprise you. But um, I think the economy is in very bad shape because this isn't an ordinary recession or even depression. This is a what I call economic martial law. They have just the mayors, the governors, the public health authorities have ordered things to shut down cold on a dime. And, and we've really got uh, some pretty serious dislocation or the, your word, uh, chaos in our economy at the moment that we're not going to come out of very easily. And David, just what, what do you have a, a, why they have done such an extreme shutdown, extreme lockdown worldwide? Yeah, why they have done it? Well, I, you know, in a way, it started in China. It's the ultimate totalitarian state. Uh, I call it the Red Ponzi. They look prosperous, but basically it's built on $50 trillion worth of debt that one of these days is going to collapse. They had an outbreak of something that, uh, you know, was not very well understood or explained to the world in Wuhan. In January, they basically locked down the economy through brutal totalitarian tactics. When the, uh, influ- when the disease, the flu, started to extend uh, to other parts of the world, everybody started copying them. Now, why in the world would we copy the red suzerains of Beijing? Or why would we want to use uh, totalitarian communist tactics when, you know, we can look at this. I just want to throw one number in, because I follow this pretty closely, and I write about it, you know, every day in my blog, David Stockman's Contra Corner, but if you even take the CDC's numbers, and of course, you know, they count, I call it the with COVID deaths, that, that's the most extreme uh, impact of this, and I say with COVID because, you know, they're counting uh, almost anything uh, that happens in a hospital uh, that uh, may or may not have related to an actual uh, coronavirus infection. But here's the point. There are 61 million young people of America, 15 or under. There have been only 45 mortalities, deaths, so far. Now, that's a rate, uh, and we we measure mortality as per 100,000 persons. That's a rate of 0.07%. In other words, seven hundredths of one person per 100,000 in that uh, age group uh, has actually uh, died, unfortunately. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum, the grand, great-grandparents, 85 and over. There are, um, there, in that group, there are 6.5 million people, but there have been 45,000 deaths. Now that's 700 per 100,000 versus 0.7 per 100,000, which is a way of saying, and I think this is really important, that your risk of death from COVID as a great-grandparent, 85 and over, is 10,000 times higher than it is for the young people who should be in school, that all over the country, the teachers unions and all the rest of them and the virus patrol and the blue state um, governors and mayors are trying to keep close. Now, let me say that again. Your risk of death is 10,000 times higher. So the point is we don't shut down schools. We don't shut down the economy. We don't shut down restaurants and what I call the social congregation uh, areas of our society. We take care of the elderly and those who already have life-threatening conditions, and that's not what we're doing. We're doing the opposite, and uh, it's it's really a mess as far as I'm concerned. So, 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 David, this is the reason I started with the fact that you went to Harvard Divinity, you work with <laughs> Reagan and all this stuff, and you and you just mentioned that we're modeling China. Does that mean we're Marxist today? <laughs> well, I, you know, I I guess I wouldn't go so far as to say that we're Marxists in a technical sense, although I think some of these um, Antifa people and the radical left that is stirring up this whole BLM uh, movement uh, might well be uh, Marxists. Certainly they're socialists. Certainly they don't understand capitalism. They don't understand prosperity comes from capitalism. They don't understand that 
free enterprise and personal liberty are the basis for a good society and a prosperous society. So yes, we have that. But I think in the mainstream, we have a bunch of politicians who've been hanging around the water cooler so long that they don't understand that we're a constitutional democracy. That if you're Governor Cuomo, you just can't come in and order a rest. You know, they've had, they're, they're still testing like crazy in New York. They're getting a half a percent or 1% positive per day of the thousands of tests they're taking. And yet this crazy governor of New York and the mayor still has all the restrooms shut down. You know, that, that's crazy. Um, basically, uh, New York went through some pretty bad times. They got herd immunity, and they ought to be opening up before they kill the economy of New York City. And frankly, they're doing that. Uh, well, I think- Hey, David, David so let's, we, we kind of know that. I'm going to get more on the thing that, you know, Marx wanted all capitalists killed. That's why socialists have murdered more people in the 20th century than capitalists ever have. But here you have this governor of New York, then you have Seattle, Portland, Newsom in California and all this. They're shutting down police. You know, yeah. they had, uh, there's, they're taking away police. Guys like you are, you know, your beautiful place in New York and you're leaving. I mean, you know, Cuomo had to get on television and say, all's forgiven, please come back and pay your taxes. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. but when you look at all that, that's why I'm saying, I want to take a bigger picture with you because of your background being with Reagan and all that. It'd be easy to ask what would Reagan do, but this is not the same economy. This is a right. very different economy. So what do you think, almost a spiritual side, how can they get rid of the police? How can they kill capitalists? You know, what are they doing? What are, what are these leftists doing? Because that's Marxism. Marxism says, you know, he says, what do you do with a guy that says, I'm going to hang the last capitalist. I'm going to hang him with the rope he sold me. Right, so it's right. always been anti cap Marx and socialism have always been anti-capitalist. And as you and I know what happened, because we're the same vintage, I took the Vietnam route and you went the other way. Yeah. But and I got spit on. I got hit with eggs and called baby killer and all that stuff. But that's part of personal development here. My <laughs> point is here is a lot of my classmates went into the school system, and that spread. You know the SDS and the Black Panther and all that stuff was just going through our generation, and I think it's matured and come out now. I mean I don't know if you agree or not, but I think it's been magnified since our generation. What do you yeah, think? I agree. Well, you know, first of all, I'll say, I'll admit, when I was an undergraduate in 1968, I was kind of an SDS uh, quasi-Marxist, not in some hardcore sense, but five years later, I was working for a Republican Congress, and I was a gung-ho, <laughs> Congressman, and I was a gung-ho free enterprise. I understood what the, I figured it out in five years, and it doesn't work. Now, the problem is, uh, these kids out there on the street uh, don't have anything else to do. They don't have jobs. They're getting handouts from the government, and I don't know if they're ever going to figure it out. But here's the problem. The problem is the mainstream Republican and Democratic politicians You know, I call it the duopoly because they basically say the same thing and pretend they're having a fight. But they are so, um, you know, they are so caught up in this anti-Trump thing that any issue that comes along that they can use as a battering ram, and listen, I I disagree with a lot of what Trump's doing, but anything that they can use as a battering ram against him it gets totally magnified by CNN and by uh, you know, MSNBC. And okay, I, I, totally, so, I totally agree. We've got to take a break. We're getting down to it, you know, because the uniqueness of you is that, you know, you, we are the same vintage. I graduated in 69. Right. And, uh, you know, Reagan was the hero of the time. But there was this huge divide in our generation. It was the SDS, you know, pro-war, anti-war, and I think, you know, I suspect it just carried on through the academic system. And that's why gold was taken out of um, economics in 1973. Right. And, and, and so we went to this mass money printing system. And today my opinion is the Fed is out of control. And they have to keep printing to try and solve our problems. And I think personally, the reason if you were the budget director under Reagan, 
can printing money solve this problem? I'll, we'll come back, and that's where we're going to start with. You don't have to get into the religious side, or all, all's forgiven before being SDS. But other than that, just, <laughs> I, I, I have a, you know, the first guy that has admitted it to me, because I've, I've called my classmates who were SDS, and he's, oh, no, 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 that wasn't passing me. But anyway, I think the effects have... Wait, 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 wait. We'll, come, we'll come right back. You're on the hot seat. And once again, we're talking to David Stockman. I mean... He's a now a refugee out of, he has a beautiful, 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 beautiful home in New York City, one of my favorite cities. And now I don't know if I ever want to go back there again. I went to school out there. But he's now hiding out in Aston, which I think is a good sign of the mass migration of the wildebeest out of communist republics like New York City. We'll be right back. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosak of the Rich Dad Dear Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. Please leave a comment or review anytime you listen. And all of our pro programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason. We're an education show. We don't sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, or gold. But we educate. And we think education should be shared. So if you have friends, family, or business associates who need to hear this, please go to Rich Dad Radio or listen to this podcast and you can decide for yourself. Our special guest today is a very important man. He was high up there in the, in the Reagan administration office of the budget. He's also went to Harvard Divinity School and he lives in New York City. He's now a refugee in Aspen, Colorado, hiding out from the crowds out there. Also former Michigan and congressman. Michigan congressman. But, you know, he comes from the Reagan point of view. But this, this economy is completely different than what Reagan faced. So the reason why I want to talk to David is he and I are the old guys. We are now the old guys in the vintage here. And we were part of the revolution. You know, like I was the guy getting spit on and eggs thrown at coming back from Vietnam. I don't know if David was throwing them, but anyway, there was guys throwing them at us. And it was a tumultuous time as it is now. And my, I suspect that a lot of those hippies that uh, were throwing eggs at guys like me, I, I just went because I didn't know what else to do. I just went. I was draft exempt. But they went into the academic system. But that was exactly the same time, David, you remember that Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. And it allowed right. us to print. So we have two major problems going on. We have COVID and we have an economy that's being propped up by a Fed. You know, like in 2008, I think their budget, they're, they're a deficit of $850 billion and today is $5 trillion. I mean, yep. they're printing money. Like So the reason you're an important guy is because you are an important guy. But, you know, you have Reagan, you have the budget, you have printing money, and we have history and we have dissent. We got a lot there. And, our, and, our, and our guest is David Stockman. You David forgot Stockman. the name, David Stockman. So, David, what's happening with the Fed and printing money? You is know, that going to save us? Is that going to save our yeah. economy? Well, absolutely not. I think the number one problem is the Fed, as is the number two and the number three problem. And the reason I say that is we've talked before about lockdown nation that we've had 50 million people lose their jobs. There's 31 million people right now drawing unemployment, state or federal, in the worst of the Great Recession, so-called, back in uh, 2009, uh, the peak level was 6 million. So we got five times more people dependent on uh, unemployment insurance today than that. We've had really millions of small businesses are being devastated because of these lockdowns or because of the new orders that you could only open at 25% of capacity or whatever. So why is this happening? Well, it's happening because... The Fed has printed so much money and monetized so much of the debt that the politicians in Washington are willing to tolerate this massive crash of our economy because they think they can compensate by handing out coast-to-coast -coast soup lines, you know, to everybody and their grandmother who tries to apply. We gave $1,200 to 160 million people. There's only 31 million people unemployed. We gave it to 160 million people. Uh, we're, you know, the, they put the federal state unemployment dole together, you know, the extra 600. Well, that makes an average benefit of $1,100 a, month, a week. In, in many states, which is almost 60,000 a year. We, you know, that, that's not a safety net. That is uh, asking for huge economic trouble. 
in the, you know, they've already passed three trillion worth of so-called, uh, uh, you know, everything bailouts. That's what I call it. The bills they passed back in March. Now they're debating whether it should be a trillion and a half. The Republicans are saying more. The Democrats are saying three and a half trillion more. And they'll probably compromise in the middle. Now, let, let's add this up. In five months, they have spent five and a half trillion dollars trying to compensate for the enormous damage done in the economy. If the Fed weren't buying all that debt, interest rates would be soaring. The politicians would not be spending all this money. They would be asking, do we need to shut everything down? So if you follow me, it's the Fed that has enabled the politicians to set up these soup lines to keep the economy going and hand out money to free stuff to everybody so that the uh, mayors and governors and health authorities and what I call the virus patrol could go to town uh, basically, uh, you know, imposing economic martial law on our economy and society. So it all starts with the Fed. If the Fed were doing its job, the Congress would not be spending $5 trillion dollars If they weren't spending $5 trillion, the pressure to allow people to go back to work and businesses to reopen would be enormous, and we wouldn't be in this mess. So if you follow me, uh, you know, all, all trails lead back to the 12 people sitting on the Fed who are out of their minds in terms of, you know, what they've done. And we can repeat the numbers, but I think a lot of listeners know Since uh, March 12th, when they declared the emergency, the COVID emergency, the Fed has printed $3 trillion dollars worth of new money, you know, just out of thin air. They used it to buy up all the bonds that the Treasury was issuing. And so now we have, uh, you know, a 10-year Treasury rate at under 0.6, under six-tenths of 1%. So nobody's alarmed, borrow, 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 spend some more. Everything, you know, uh, is a big, big free lunch. And uh, you, you can see how it all uh, comes together. It's a very, so, so you, very, you, know, you know, David, you've been warning about this for years. You know, the great, uh, yeah. all of your books have been saying the same warning. Is the end right. near? How, how close are we to when people finally realize I mean, it was the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe or, or Venezuela? How, well, how you know, it, it's a good question, and I think we're getting close. I could not have imagined four or five years ago when I wrote uh, The Great Deformation that the Fed would have a $7 trillion balance sheet because, you know, back then it was about two and they said it was an emergency and they were going to roll it back. So what has happened is that we have an unelected, uh, you know, uh, 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 set of 12 people sitting on the Fed who basically have taken – total control of the financial system and uh, have distorted every price. You know, the stock market is way too high. Bond yields are way too low. Um, you know, everything uh, is uh, no longer working honestly. Uh, there's no price discovery. Why have a free market on Wall Street if the Fed is dominating uh, and, uh, you know, injecting these massive amounts of liquidity? Okay, so let me ask this. Let me ask, so, because you're, You were the Reagan era, and today we have the Trump era. And I think one of them was the gutsy things that Reagan did was when the uh, air traffic controllers went on strike, he just said, you're all fired. Right. So, I mean, that was a gutsy move. So if Reagan was here today, I know Trump is encouraging the Fed to print. What would Reagan do that Trump is not doing? Reagan would, I believe, would fire Dr. Fauci. <laughs> and he would use the fire thing, okay? He, you can't you go into hiding, it. David. <laughs> you can't stand and borrow your way out of a problem created by this enormous lockdown a disaster in the economy. And he would have fired the scarf lady as well. And that's Dr. Bur uh, Burks, you know? Look at these two characters. She's been on the government payroll her whole life since she got out of law school, I think, or wherever she went. And uh, Dr. Fauci graduated in 1968 from Cornell. He could have, just like I did from Michigan State, he could have made an honest living. But instead, he, 
you know, he went to the NIH, uh, became a researcher at the Institute for Infectious Diseases and Allergies, and he's been there ever since. Now, between the two of them, they got 95 years on the public payroll. What do they know about how an economy runs? What do they know about, you know, a businessman who created a, a chain of five restaurants and worked at it for 20, 30 years, is Sprint, saved, uh, foregone, you know, uh, some of the uh, luxuries of life to build this business and they come in and shut it down overnight on a, uh, you know, on the basis of a totally exaggerated notion of uh, what we should be doing. So if he, if he would fire uh, the uh, bad doctors, I call it his malpracticing doctors, and if he would denounce the virus patrol and say, we really are going to open up, we're going to take care of the sick and the elderly, but we're going to let young people go to school, we're going to let workers go back to work, we're going to let uh, 20-somethings go to the bars if they want to or go to a ball game if they want to, and uh, you know, we're going to get real here. This is what I think uh, Reagan would do. Uh, he never would have fallen for this whole you know, a doctor's plot. Um, he was smart enough to see through it. So now, how, do, how do we make that scenario happen, David? How does that how does that come about? Because I don't know if anybody's speaking up about it other than you. Um, yeah, there's a I, lot I, of, I hope you have armed guards around you. <laughs> well, they don't know where I am. <laughs> I'm up in the mountain cabin, you know, they're not going to find me up here. But, uh, you know, the truth is there's a lot of people uh, speaking out about it, but uh, the politicians are so cowed. They're so intimidated by uh, this whole, you know, this is as bad. You know, I, I say the word, uh, I say the year uh, 1693, and most people have no idea, 1693, so what? You guys know, uh, th those were the Salem witch trials in 1693, and the whole population went into hysteria. We got something like that uh, today. We have a population that's hysterical. And by the way, you've noted several times I'm here at Aspen. Well, this is the Socialist Republic of Aspen. I hate to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I All the rich people come here, and the sheeples are so uh, intimidated by all this that the conforming uh, level is so great that I'm hiking every day up the mountainside, and you find these guys who are on what they call the fat tire bicycles. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're big fat tires. They ride uphill. It is really hard. I mean, uh, you've got to be in great shape. It is an aerobic nightmare to do. But here's my point. These guys are riding uphill on a fat tire bicycle with their mask on. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> the point is, there's been such a level of intimidation, there's such a level of fear and hysteria that people are running around, uh, you know, with their uh, muzzles on, um, and they shouldn't be. Someone like me, uh, I'm of an age where I should worry about it. Uh, I had chemotherapy, so I probably have an immune system that's compromised, so I'm not going to run around. But at the same time, I'm not going to tell a 30-year-old kid he can't go to the bar and have some fun, you know, <laughs> because if he gets it, he won't even know it. It'll be asymptomatic or he'll have a mild flu and recover. That's what's going on. Do you know that 99.6% of all the people who have been tested positive for COVID have recovered? They never tell you that. No. You have CNN giving the death count every night. Uh, and uh, it's a totally uh, distorted uh, picture. You see, our, our, our uh, virus was a thing called AIDS. Remember that? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It, it, AIDS yeah. is still here, but we're still yeah. having sex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, by the way, you know, uh, the, the number of deaths from AIDS uh, is a very low number. It's like four or 5,000 a year in the whole United States. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, th th there's this whole death brigade that has got this thing totally distorted. We forget the fact that, unfortunately, that's part of life. Three million people die every year, and um, 55, 60,000 die of the regular colds and influenza. Um, so, you know. How, how about how about at-home violence? I have the final question, too, because the difference between Reagan's era and today is social media. You have Facebook, Google, and Amazon and all this. How do you think that's affecting... I call it anti-social social media. You know, you, you can, yeah. it's, a, it's a violation of the sixth amendment. 
is that they can accuse you, but you can't see, you don't see your accuser. Right. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. And um, I think what it's done is accelerated uh, the time scale so much that we're in this 24 uh, seven word, uh, you know, uh, sound bite uh, talking point world where just fundamental facts like the one I started with that your risk of death from COVID is 10,000 times greater if you're 85 and you probably have underlying conditions already than if you're a young people, a young person. And it's like 400 times greater if you're a working age person. Uh, uh, I mean, than if you're a working age person. So uh, none of these facts are known. Uh, they're, they're out there. You can find them. They're actually a lot of them published by the CDC itself. And uh, what happens is that the anti-Trump media, uh, what, you know, we call it the MSM. I'm sure that's what you call it. Um, is so obsessed with making Trump look bad that they will dig for anything that can be spun yes. as a negative. I saw the other day a big headline on CNN, cases rising in Indiana. Indiana. <laughs> the cases in Indiana are practically nothing. Okay, but at that moment in time, Arizona was going down, Florida was going down, California even was abating. They had to find something to have a negative uh, banner across the screen on. So they discovered a couple more cases in Indiana. Now, let me tell you how bad this is getting. Maybe I can wind up on this one because this is a warning sign to people. In New Zealand, they got a radical progressive prime minister, a woman who's, uh, you know, way out on the borderline Marxist. Uh, shut, you know, but she shut down, as you remember back a while, shut down the whole New Zealand economy, not going to let anybody in. We're not going to get to COVID. They went 102 days without any cases. Okay. They had four of them this week, and she's reclosed the economy, shut down the economy again because of four people. cases. Four cases, oh, not yeah. even deaths, just yeah, cases. Yeah, we have a mayor in. Los Angeles, who said he's going to shut off the electrical power and water to any house that's reported of having an unauthorized party. Okay. That's crazy. Now, if that's not totalitarian uh, abuse of power, I don't know what is. And supposedly, Los Angeles is a democracy, and so is New Zealand. This is the kind of thing that's cropping up, uh, and I don't think we've seen the rest of it yet. I agree with you. And, you know, David. That was a Sermon on the Mount. I mean, you earned your uh, theological degree there. Uh, I, and I, I thank you for uh, speaking out. You know, a lot of people will disagree with you, but you still spoke and said what I believe is true. And that's okay. the most important thing. If you agree with me, you're intelligent, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. And I also want to mention David's website because he's a wealth of information. As you just heard, David Stockman, ContraCorner.com, Contra Corner. C-O-N-T-R-A, ContraCorner.com. And his books are The Trump of Politics, The Great Deformation, and Trumped. If you need a boat anchor, these are great books. I've gone through <laughs> them. It takes a long time, but it, it does open up your mind to a different world. But David Stockman, again, he started from Harvard School of Divinity. He's a congressman. He went to, you know, he's part of Reagan's budget director. I mean, he's seen the world through, I mean, incredible eyes of one of the greatest changes you know, starting from the Vietnam War through now. So anyway, please get his book, study. He is um, essential we understand what he's talking about today. And David, you have a blog, right, a daily blog called Contra Corner, correct? It's called David Stockman's Contra Corner. You can Google it. Uh, I put this stuff out every day. We cover everything from the Fed to Washington to the budget to, to the corona to what's happening in the world. Because somehow you have to put it all together. And it, we call it Contra Corner for a reason. Contrarian. We don't buy the MSM. We don't buy what CNN is telling us or CNBC about the market or the New York Times or the Washington Post. Uh, there is another view on the world. I think it's important that people, uh, uh, you know, uh, consult that. Um, and that's what I try to do daily. Well, you know, David, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, you know, being able to call you and bring you on the Rich Dad Radio Show. So thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, David. You better go into deep hiding now. Thank you. (laughs) No, keep speaking out. Keep speaking out. Especially in Aspen. Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, bye. Uh, Thank you, you know, David Stock. What did you think, Kim? 
Well, I, I, it's refreshing. You know, I'm so tired of the media and you I'm see. so tired of all the name. I'm all so tired of this damn virus. And um, I think what he's saying is absolutely true. And I would highly recommend um, going to his uh, daily blog at Con David Stockman Contra Corner. One thing he's saying is you got to think for yourself. Stop following like sheep. And think Sheeple. for yourself. Get some in real information. And, and don't get a fat tire bike and pump uphill with and a mask with a on. With a mask on. Oh, my God. That's just so unhealthy. That's so unhealthy. A f final word on this is that gold and silver took a huge hit today. And, you know, if you're a speculator, this you, should, you probably should get out. But if you're an investor, this is the best opportunity to buy. Not because it's gold and silver because it's exactly what David and myself and people have been saying is the Fed is going to keep printing money. They're going to keep printing money to solve this problem. That means the dollar is gone as a reserve currency of the world, which makes gold, silver, Bitcoin more valuable because they operate outside the system of the Fed. So with that said, I want to thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. This was entertaining. I had to start with the fact that he was a theologian, and so he has some kind of soul and spirit left. Thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Thank Radio you. Show.